Greetings and salutations and welcome to this exciting episode of the Playwright Spotlight. I'm re-recording the intro to this episode due to some audio issues I happen to have during the recording. The audio on my end is a little bit choppy, it's repetitive, it drops in and out, but luckily I don't do a lot of the talking. But rather than lose the integrity and the information provided in this episode, I thought it better to go ahead and move forward and keep it as is. That being said, all I ask you to do is forgive the audio issues on my end because the information provided is quite informative and I think you'll enjoy it. That being said, my guest today is a playwright, producer, and lifelong resident of New York City. He founded the Blue Rose Stage Company at age 18, serving as its artistic director for six years. At Tada Youth Theater, he served as artistic associate and literary manager, commissioning and supporting new works. In 2003, he was selected as a new generation's future leader by Theater Communications Group. And in 2017, he joined the staff of the Dramatist Guild, where he serves as the executive director for creative affairs and membership, where he's overseen the membership grow from 6,500 members to over 8,500 members in just three years, in which I'm honored to say that I was one of them. Emmanuel Wilson... Thanks for stepping into the Playwright Spotlight. Oh, okay. It's, yeah. actually, it's actually now up to 10,000. 10,000. Well, Emmanuel, well, Emmanuel Will stepping into the Playwright Spotlight. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hi. I'm here. This, this is exciting because, you know, we usually do playwrights, but, you know, there's there's so much more to playwriting in, in the business side that people just don't understand. So uh, I think the most important question is what exactly is the Dramatist Guild? The Drummond's Guild um, is the National Association of Playwrights, Composers, Lyricists, and Librettists. And uh, the way I sort of tell everyone the story is that everyone in our industry, pretty much, um, is unionized, right? They are workers. They are labor. Even though there are a number of individuals who still own their intellectual property rights. But um, for us, as writers... Um, we're not allowed by federal labor law to unionize. Therefore, 100 years ago, writers came together and they formed this organization, not only for as a big information share, but also to sort of stand together and say, okay, these, these conditions are substandard. What do we need to actually prosper? in this industry what are the kinds of things that we need to make sure that we can have a lifelong career you know an actor can act right you can find work everywhere and i know all of that's debatable right a director can find work so you could be doing multiple shows in a year you could be doing one show for a long time you know a writer will be working on a play or a musical for a very long period of time unpaid Let's remember that. They're working on something unpaid. You know, it's like you're building your own company and you're the only investor. And then you sort of, you go into the world and you're like, oh, who wants to invest in my work? Well, you actually don't recoup that that time. You don't recoup that in your, in your finances. Um, you know, writers don't get paid for rehearsal normally. There are a number of theaters who have started to do that as best practice. But... Um, the Dramatist Guild is here so that, one, we can be an aggressive advocate, okay? okay. Two, we can create model contracts that, um, that can sort of outline best practices. We can't enforce the contracts. We're not a union. But what we can do is we can use it as a form of education. We can use it as a tool to say, hey, here are the things you should be thinking about. One of the primary services we have... Um, is our business affairs department. It's our business affairs help desk. And that's what members can come and talk to a lawyer on staff to actually review their unsigned contract or actually just ask any question. We don't give legal advice, you know, because we're not anyone's individual lawyer, but we give business advice. And there's no other organization that really has the wealth of knowledge. We're talking about 100, 102 years of dramatist history and advocacy. That's what we that's what we share every time we're interacting with someone. We want to make sure that you are advocating for the best deal on your behalf, because unlike your your fellow individuals who are in unions, they have the right to collectively bargain. 
right? They can go ahead and do that. We can't. So this is a big old information share, resource share, advocacy, education. Um, so yeah, that was a long answer, but you know, no, it's it's great. But I, I would I, so two, I, so two came out of that. One one might be a statement, but, but you had mentioned like writers don't the writers can't unionize. But how do you explain the WGA? Well, we can collectively bargain and then, then turn around, turn around and like. Right. When you're dealing with film, the, the, the primary distinction is we're not employees. Right? right. We don't work for a theater. Right. So when a theater does our work, we're not the employee. That's why we, when we're there, we can't get health insurance. That's why when we're there, we can't get those benefits. Um, because we own our work. We own our intellectual property. And, and we don't work for anybody. Now, in Hollywood and you know, film and television, that's a work for hire situation, sure. which means that I'm hiring you to do a job, but at the end of the day, I own your work. Right. That belongs to me. I own the intellectual property. Therefore, I can make as many Batman movies as I want. <laughs> yeah. Like I can have 15 Batman if I want. It doesn't matter because I can manage that intellectual property however I see fit. And I can go to this writer and that writer to make, okay, I can go to five different writers on a script, make sure they get paid, but they have a union behind them to say, hey, if you're coming in, this is how, they, this is how you're going to credit them. This is what they get paid. So well, all I of think, them are organized because they're, you know, they're, they're essentially workers. They're employees. Well, I think that's kind of one of the protections that the, the, the huge, prote huge protection playwrights have if they play their cards correctly and that they, they own their work. That they never give up, that you know, they they right to it, but, you know, to an extent. I mean, they can have that, that, that exclusive contract with this particular publisher, they can't go else, but but I don't know if I don't know if as a group we fully understand that idea, sure, sure. in that you know, the power dynamics in our industry are so. You know, you, you, you can't make theater without a writer. It doesn't make any difference if the dancer is a writer. You know, it doesn't make a difference, like, who's writing it, right? You can be putting up the lights in one section, but then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, I'm writing this down and this is a script. You've now switched to a writer. And, you know, in those moments, people forget that they own their work, they have right for approval. They have right. They have the right to say where it will and won't be performed. But the power dynamics in our industry, sometimes writers forget that. Right. And because we, it's a solitary industry. It's a solitary profession, rather. Um, you, you, you're willing to sometimes say yes to things that maybe you shouldn't in order to get produced. So that sometimes switches the power dynamic there. Sure. But let, let me, let me kind of push back on that. I'll push back on that a little bit mm -hmm. from both, both sides and sides. And I'll give you, give you a little background is because when I first started, I do the, uh, the play noir, it's a film mm -hmm. noir style and act festival. Right. When I first started out, so started out to that, just deciding we were going to do this. And I'd reached out to a former college professor and I said, Hey, we're looking for a uh, film noir style plays. Would you like to, you know, let your students know about this. He's like, I'm going to, I'm going to let them know, but I'm not going to encourage them to participate because I'm a firm believer in the playwrights bill of rights, which he sent me. And I read this and I'm like, right. absolutely. There's nothing on here. I don't, I don't disagree with. Um, so I was kind of, kind of a little taken aback with that. Now that being said, um, where was I going with this? That being said, being said, what about like people that just haven't made a name yet? And that this is an opportunity for them to like, yeah, okay, right now, now I just, I need something, I need something that, that, sh that shows that I've been, you know, that somebody's willing to invest their money yeah. in, in me. So they're willing to say yes to, 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 to opportunities because don't, do you think that's a necessary evil? No, no, it's, no you, you know, you want to educate the writer so that they understand um, how to say yes, when to say yes and how to say yes. You know, every writer has a right to submit to any festival, but they also have the the responsibility to sort of see, um, is there any remuneration for that? Um, is, you know, are, are, are the people who are being selected 
um, what are they being paid, right? Um, you know, what kind of publicity will be done? There are some festivals that are like, hey, great, we're going to do this, and you raise the money, you know? So then that actually makes you a producer. So, you know, in those instances, it's about educating the writer so that they can say, does this work for me? Can I do this? Yes. Because the goal is to actually create the work and share it with the world, you know, um, in whatever form you so choose. So if you want to submit to that festival, great. That's no problem. But if you're submitting to a festival that's not necessarily paying anyone, then are, are other people getting paid and the writers are not getting paid or the actors right. are sure. paid and the directors are getting paid, but then the writers aren't getting paid. Right. That, you know, that creates a, um, a balance in the relationship where if if you want someone's labor, you need to pay for it, right? So um, it's just about having, I want to be careful not using the words good judgment because everyone has their own definition of that. Sure, right? fair enough, fair enough. You have the right to make the best decision for yourself. And I think the, the goal of the Dramas Guild is to educate you enough so you feel confident in making those decisions. You know the questions to ask and you know how to poke holes in it so that um, at the end of the day, you don't, you don't, you don't feel exploited, right? Sure. That's the overall goal. Right, right. Go, go And the, the other thing I wanted to, to piggyback on and push back a little bit is that you'd, you'd mentioned that don't get, you, you, when playwrights write right, when we write, we're not getting paid at that moment. But at the same time, it's the only thing that you've, that, it's one of the few jobs that you can, you can actually still be making money as one of our other playwrights that we interviewed in, in the past episodes. Like, I had a, a play that was being produced, produced across the, on the other side of the world in a different time zone while I was asleep. And I'm making Absolutely. money in my sleep. So Absolutely. if you're successful, successful, and, and I, I use that term loose, loosely because yeah. everybody has the def, different, def, different definitions. Like you can have that same, that same play, you know, running in five, six different, different cities. Absolutely. So but that's getting a return that on more. more. Yeah. But that's getting a return on your investment. Sure. Absolutely. Like you've got an, the thing that you just described is an, is an equitable return on the investment. Sure. You, you took that risk as a writer to devote that amount of time. You trusted your, yourself. You, you made the connections. You did the work. It got picked up. Other people are doing it. And now that passive income is coming in. Sure. That's great. But the reality is um, not everyone has that, you know, again, that definition of success, right? Um, sure. There's, there's more opportunities. There's Actually, there's more writers than opportunities, right? So it's always a risk. It's always a risk for you. So I think my relationship to that comment is, you know, the full totality of our work, right? right? From, from blank page to bringing it to a theater to then doing drafts and doing rewrites, you know, we're only acknowledged financially for part of that work. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. We're not acknowledged for the full, you know, for the full history of that work, because you could be toiling on something for five, six, seven years. Right. Again, it's yeah. a risk, but because we love this art form so much, we're going to put that energy in. We're going to write that script and we want to put it in the market so that the market can say, Hey, we want to do this play everywhere, regard theaters, churches, you know, community theaters, schools, colleges, universities. Great. Um, but it's just looking at that balance. I think when when you are building a relationship between your work, your time and hopefully what you'll be paid throughout your lifetime. Right. Right. What are the benefits of joining the guild? I think the, the primary benefit is, um, as I stated before, the primary benefit is our business affairs department. I think that's that's a core. We have a whole list um, on our website of all of the different member benefits and career services. But the, the core is not only the model contracts that we offer, right, um, on licensing, on translation, um, best practices when working with a director, um, contracts for device creators, right? Um, not only that, but also the ability to have someone to communicate with and ask questions of. You know, we have a wealth of content that we've um, built for a number of years, 
and we use that content to educate. So I think that's the, that's the primary benefit of why you're a member. There's always the moral reason in that writers have created a path for you and what is your responsibility by taking on this career to create a path for somebody else? And that means every time you make a deal, you you want that's a moment to advocate for the people that are coming in behind you, right? So making sure that as a member, you have access to that core information to make you the best um, entrepreneur possible. I think that's the primary. That's the primary thing. Um, that's a primary benefit, I think. You 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 listed you listed a few things in there. I want to say that I heard device creator, uh, devised device creator. creator. What is a device creator for for more well, for myself and anybody else who might be listening or watching, who who's not familiar with the term? Um, you know, device theater. You can look at improv, right? You know, there's different models of creating theater, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily someone that's coming in with a script that's already formed. Maybe you're using a rehearsal process to go and do that. Maybe you're using yes. people um, who are not normally actor, uh, who are not normally writers, right? They're coming to the room and they're creating the piece as you go along. Um, so that's sort of the that would like be an ensemble piece, like people that got together is like I like what this yeah. is. Let's stick with this theme, like, you know, Lincoln City might be a prime example, example where, you know, they do love to write sketch. Right. You know, and then I guess the finished project, product that comes out of that. Okay. De okay. De device creator. Um, now, I know there's different tiers. Mm -hmm. Guilt. What are they and how do they differ? We have the member level and then we have the associate level. Um the member level are, are those who have been, uh, who have had the opportunity to be produced or um, published. You have a licensing deal, right? And associates are individuals who have composed a script or score and at least had a stage reading, right? We, we want that. We want to make sure we open the doors to people at all stages of their career because we don't want the individuals who have never had a production to not have that information when they get their first contract, right? We want them to be able to come to the guild. And that's a question I get a lot in terms of, you know, when should I join the guild? You know, you should join the guild as soon as you made a decision to make this a career because it's not about being ready. It's not about having a contract. It's about taking the time to develop yourself in the things you don't know ask those questions so that you're not under the deadline of signing a contract, right? That you take that time so that when you've got a contract, you're like, yeah, you know, I've been working with the drama skills. I have a basic understanding. I still have some questions, but you want to join as soon as possible. I've had so many conversations with people who are like, you know, when I get a production, that's the worst time because you're in it, right. you're in it and you're already talking to people and, you know, you, you want to take a step back and say, this is about professional development, right? This is about career development. What are the things that you need? What are the things you're looking for? What are the things the industry needs that the guild can provide? Um, so those are the those are the primary levels of membership. We also have a legacy membership level for those who have estates, right? So members who have passed on, and now there's someone in control of their intellectual property. Um, those individuals have the ability to join the guild. We also have a business subscription, and that's for agents, managers, um, theaters, institutions that want to have a relationship with us so that they can have access to make sure that they're doing the best for the dramatists as, as possible. The, the, correct me if I'm wrong, there's also a Swiss as, as well? Let's say that again. I didn't catch that. I'm sorry. Uh, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. There's also a, a student level as well. We don't we don't consider a student level. There's a student discount. Got it. So Got it. so basically fifty percent off of whatever level you actually meet. Okay. And um, we sort of open that up to anyone that's in a college, university, or um, you know any sort of degree or certificate program, however you define that, because you can be a student at any age, and we want to make sure that we're acknowledging that. What about a high school student? High school student, absolutely. Okay, That's actually just making sure. Yeah, that actually falls under our um, Young Dramatists Initiative, where, oh. you know, we're a trade association. I think it's our responsibility 
to pass along the trade and walk people through how they can make a career, right? Because there's so many different ways to actually build a career in, and we want people to have access to that as soon as possible. Okay. You mentioned that uh, for, for a member, a member produced or published. Mm-hmm. Now, is that, a, is, that, is that limited to any particular publisher or does it, does it matter? Um, it, does it have to be say in French or, or, or no, or, or it, uh, it, service or I, I want to be careful with this answer because there's a lot of wonderful different licensing houses. Um, I, it's not, you can be with any one of them, but I, I think that's really born out of you've made an agreement, you've signed a contract with someone and that, that company can take that work and license it for other people to use. Right. Sure. Um, so, you know, we want to be careful because then you get into the self-publishing, which, you know, anyone can publish, but it's really about your work is at, um, you built your career where your work is at a level where there is investment, right? Sure. There's a, a buy-in in your work so that, you know, you're at a, a, a different kind of professional level there. Yeah. Um, that you can prove. Okay. Uh, what are what are some of the benefits that some members may not even realize that is that they're at their disposal? God, there's so many. Um, I noticed. <laughs> there, there's a lot. Um, it's so funny because I built all the lists of all of our member benefits and career services. And I'm like, which are they? You know, so is there one that just like stands out as like this? I'm like, this is such a great, a great um, benef benefit. But he ever takes advantage of it because they just may, they may not realize it's there. Or there, There's two I can think of. You okay. know, we we produce um, we produce a magazine about six times a year called The Dramatist. And um, you can subscribe without being a member. But um, if you're a member, you get that um, as part of your, your membership packet. And, you know, the conversations that are had in that magazine, it's written by, by members for writers, right? There are some powerful conversations, um, enlightening conversations that uh, I don't think anyone else is having. Is now, there one in particular that stands out to you? Um, and I forget the name of the article, and it's something that we're working on right now. Um, J. Ellen Zimmerman, um, who is a composer who's, who's deaf, wrote this really powerful piece um, in an issue of the drama this last year, where he, where he talked about, here are the things that we all can start doing um, in terms of accessibility, right? And having a writer openly have that conversation to other writers, industry leaders, I think um, is what is the kind of opportunity that we can provide at the Drama Guild. And that's the kind of conversation that we want to have in that magazine. So I think that's a, that magazine is a real value add. Um, the other one is our online resource directory. We used to produce um, a really thick book of you know, theaters and grant opportunities and retreats and, I mean, you name it. Oh, you know, a host of submission opportunities and also just resources for, for dramas. We actually stopped printing that um, about two, three years ago because we moved the whole thing online, which has really given us the, the opportunity to expand what we can put in there. You know, during the pandemic, you know, we were able to just quickly put in, here's all the places in your state where you can, you know, unemployment office for every single state, you know, to be able to just put that information in. Or uh, health assistance, what kind of um, health care do you need? And, you know, what are you looking for? Let's point you in that direction. So I think our resource directory, which still has submission deadlines, submission opportunities, information about theater, but we've been able to expand it in a, uh, a holistic way of acknowledging the kind of full experience that you're having as a writer and so like what's in there. So I think those two, I think those two benefits are, I think those two benefits are really cool. I also think our video library is, um, 
is uh, something I'm pretty proud of. You know, we we have a number of of conversations that we can make available to membership, and um, it's it's just it's great to be able. If you can't come to the event, um, and we're you know, actually having one tonight, um, you can't come to the event just to be able to go in and look at it on your own time. And it's something that I hope we can grow um, and, and really get better at because it's sort of acknowledging, you know, technology and how that can really reach people um, in terms of our message. So, yeah. What's the most common inquiry, the inquiry that you guys, the guild gets when, it, when, when members reach out? Um, there's a number of them. And I want to be careful because I don't work in the business affairs department. Um, you know, one of, well, two, how do I get an agent and how do I get produced? Okay. Which um, are two questions that uh, we kind of can't answer for you, right? Because our, our goal is to prepare you when you're ready to be produced, right? Make sure you have that business knowledge. Our goal is to make sure that you can work with your agent and direct them a certain way, but you you understand the business. Those are the two questions we get a lot. And it's um, speaking in, in membership specifically, um, it's actually really great to talk to members because you actually get to have a, a conversation where you can pivot them to a deeper understanding of who they should be in relationship to making business deals for themselves, right? I know it's scary. We're looking at the legal contracts and the language, and but it, even just understanding the basics of of what what what's yours and how to collaborate and creating those boundaries so that you can actually go into the situation and have a, a really strong, great collaboration because that's what we all want. We want to be able to go in there and have the best time, but you've got to work out the business first so that you can go in there and everything's good. Um, but those are the two questions that I, I normally get. Okay. And what's, what's the best piece of advice that, that you would give to, to new playwrights? Oh. I have to put you on the spot. No, you know, you put me on the spot a little bit. It's okay. You know, the, the best piece of advice I tell people is, and I want to be careful, it's it's not coming from a negative place at all. Because I, I don't believe that everyone um, behaves in malice, you know? It's, it's more about a, um, a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding. Um, and we're here to share and educate and we want it, We want people to understand the nature of our labor, uh, but but the, the greatest thing is when to say no. And it's it's actually really hard to do that. Um, you know, again, you want to be as educated as possible, so that you can look at the situation. Does it fit what you need? Does it fit uh, your career trajectory? Is it? Are you going to have fun? Is it a good experience? Like whatever those questions are for yourself. And, and sometimes sometimes it's okay to say no, and people are afraid. They're afraid that they'll never work again. They'll, they're afraid that they'll be labeled, that they're difficult and hard to deal with. But uh, no is a really powerful place to be. Same as yes, right? Because if you know, if you know when to say no, you know when to say yes. Sure. You know when to say, all right, here, here's the... Here are my non-negotiables. This is what I need to actually prosper. And that allows you to say, oh, but I, I want to say yes to this. Understanding that um, in your collaborative process. And you, you never want to be too firm on that no, right? Right, so right. Take that no so far that they forget that there is a, a, a process of collaboration. You're taking your work and you are... Um, you're seeing it up on its feet. You're working with actors. You're working with directors. People are going to give you ideas left and right. It's your responsibility to say, I think that's a great idea. I'll, I'll incorporate that. Or, you know what? I see where you're going, but this is, this is a story I'm trying to tell. Let me tell you why, right? 
Um, sometimes in business, you, there it needs to be a hard no because that contract for that work will follow you for your whole career, depending on what the life of the work is. So what are you agreeing to, not just now or down the line? Down the line. And having that perspective of saying, okay, this is what I'm comfortable with. I'll give in on these, but these are my hard no's. Having the ability to be able to figure out which is which, I think empowers writers in a way where you know when to say yes, because you know yourself. And it's not about, oh, I want to be produced so badly, I'll say yes to anything. Nobody should say yes to anything, you know, anytime. You know, every, you need to be able to look at it with a critical eye, not from a place of negativity or mistrust, but a place of, okay, well, what are we asking for and what are we doing? I mean, that to me is the very definition. That's the difference between an amateur and a professional. You know? Right. I think we, we, we make this distinction about, well, a professional is getting produced and an amateur is not. No, that's actually not true. A professional understands their business. They understand their business and they know, and they're constantly getting better at it. They understand their, their market. They understand their place in it. They understand how to push themselves. They understand how to challenge themselves. And when something is pre pre uh, presented to them, they know enough to say, you know what I don't know about? I don't know enough about this. I need to talk to someone. So we need to pause. Like that for me is a definition of a professional. Like I'm taking my business seriously. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, going back to, you, you know, worrying about oh, if I say no, I'll never work in this. I think there's that, that common misconception, misconception, at least here in, in Hollywood, especially because I think there's this idea. I mean, even when I was first started studying theater, the, the blackball term was – thrown around left and right, right. And everybody in Hollywood knows each other, each other, you know, and I, I, I'm sure that, the, that the people think things as far as theater goes, or at least Broadway, that everybody knows each other and everybody's friends and they just all live in the same neighborhood and, you know, you know, hang out after, after the play. You know, theater, you know, theater is, uh, theater is all over the country. Exactly. And it's huge, but at the same time, Sometimes it can feel rather small, right? Right, and and I think that's I think you, you hit you hit it, you know, right on the head. You know, there's this fear that you got to play the game. Yeah. You know, well, in order to play the game, you have to know the game. You got to know the rules too, and there aren't. You got to know the rules, but you also have to know that sometimes your rules are different from their rules, and there's there's things that they need in order to prosper. There's things that you need in order to prosper. What is, where, where, where's that give? And being able to be professional enough to have that conversation and say, you know what? Um, this isn't the greatest deal, but I can see w the full benefits down the line, right? I can see it's not the greatest experience, but you know what? I'm going to say yes to this because I can see that this, 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 there's something coming there, right? right. And, or being able to say, you know what? I, I understand that, you know, this may be option for a Broadway show, but I may not, I don't know if we fit as collaborators. So, you know what? I'm going to walk away right now. And that was my my next question. I was going to ask is I like that you know sometimes maybe it is important to say yes to everything just because it's an opportunity, but not to feel like your contracts aside, of course, right? To feel like you're you know that you you can't have a good part and say, realize, realize that this good match. Yeah, you know, I, th I know that there's that that's a, that shaky ground to, to to walk on necessarily that bad advice. You know, being able to walk away in the middle of something. Yeah. But, um you know, it's um, you know, every writer makes their own. Sorry, I, our office is in Times Square, That's right. <laughs> right in the theater district. I hear sirens throughout the day, so you know, um, so this too shall, shall pass. That's uh, nice. You know, again, and that's where you, again, that's the part about being a professional. 
that I think people need to invest the time and energy into. You need to know enough about yourself. Um, and sometimes you have to go through the experience to know about yourself, sure. right? You know, it's, it doesn't come automatically. But you have these experiences. And that's where sometimes it is good to say, you know what, I'm going to say yes, because I... I'm going to have an experience that I I I, I want to have. I want to get this. I want to get this information. I want to see what this is like. So that's that's great. But you need to know enough about yourself to say this is great. This isn't working, or at least have the conversation up front of like, hey, this is how I I love to collaborate. How do you work? You right. know, because there's so many dream teams that have been put together that just you know, film, television, theater that just I couldn't get it for whatever the reason. And I always love to unpack those. I sure. love to unpack like when it didn't work, because then I think that's a really great lesson in, you know, is it someone's vision that uh, took over? Is it, is it someone that always said no and was so rigid you couldn't actually, you know, move forward? You know, what is that? Um, you, you've got to find that balance for yourself um, because, you know, part of the joy of theater for me is the experience of sitting in a room with people I don't know, I've never met, and here we may be laughing at the same time, we may be clapping at the same time, we may be cheering at the same time. We had this cathartic event that changes us, right? We're looking through the lens of, of, of someone else's world that teaches us more about who we are and who we could be. And always remember that, um, you know, we pass along that joy in that kind of whatever collaboration, you know, and sometimes we, 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 we pass off something that, doesn't look like joy and sometimes the audiences can feel that sometimes you can put a nice little professional veneer over it and no one will ever know no one will ever know but you know it's that kind of experience from collaboration production to the audience sharing that is a, a hell of a time and um i think i just want writers to be um to know themselves enough to say, yeah, I'm ready for this. It might be rocky, but I'm. Let's go for it. Let's go because you got to learn. You know, that's the best time that you learn. You learn by doing, and that's that is the best way that um, uh, writers can get that professional experience. Which is why theaters do need to um, take that risk on writers. You got to take that chance because you can only learn so much in a stage reading or a workshop. You know, you've got to go through the production process. You've got to go through the through the working with a set designer, working with a sound designer, working with a costume designer, listening to an audience that maybe this audience is responding and that one isn't at all. You've got to go through that. Do you encourage suction? No, say that again. I totally missed that. Do you encourage self self production, self produce for playwrights? Um to 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 boost that pro process along as far as the learn as the learning process goes you know i i want to be careful i i don't the guild doesn't have a a particular view on whether or not we encourage or just you know but me personally as a human being someone who's that was my primary way of getting my work into the world sure um if you are able to do it go for it because it is it is an amazing learning experience because you uh, you get to understand how everything is put together and you get to understand everyone's part and you gain a, a different level of respect. You know, you gain a, you know, my favorite time in, in shows was always tech. Tech was the greatest time because you, you got to see the lighting designer at work. You got to see the set designer doing their job. You got to see the stage hands. You got to see these people who are helping bring your your work together. And 
you have a, a completely different level of like, oh, people get this and this is a great experience. Hopefully everyone's, you know, loving the show, loving the moment. You know, maybe sometimes it's just a job and that's okay too. But um, when you self-produce, um, whether sometimes you have the resources to hire everyone, sometimes, you know, it's sort of ragtag and you're doing it yourself. But either way, you understand all sides. You under, and I think that's a, a holistic way of looking at this industry. You know, the fact that I've been able to be a director and a producer and a writer and I've hung lights and, you know, I, I, my lighting designer, you know, um, got a gig and, you know, now I've got to come up with a lighting plot and you're like, okay, I got to figure this out. You, you, you learn to understand everyone's language and how they come together. Um, so, you know, everything's a risk, right? When you give your play to a theater or a contest and festival, it's a risk. Self-producing is, is a risk just like everything else. Um, you know, but again, you know, you're talking about business. So what's the math? What's the money? Um, can you do it? Is it gonna, is it gonna take your house away? Like how far, how far are you getting in? Um, you know, who's your group? Who's your group of people that you trust to help you? Um, which is always fun because you learn so, so much about each other in those moments. But well, um, yeah. No, well, I think that, that the things on, on, on those points, I think that some writers or actors or whatever you want to, uh, whatever as whatever aspects thing you want to go into, don't realize realize how accessible it is. They always think that it's whatever the background is. If they if, if they came from academia, then they're it's a, almost a limitless limitless budget for the most part. Yeah, and I and or else they might have seen something on Broadway or, or something at one of the bigger um, um, local theaters. Like down here, we have the Amundsen and the, the Pantages and that's yeah. like oh well, that's what I have to do. They don't realize there might be some little theaters, some smaller theaters that you know that, that don't have a, don't don't take a lot of um, resources to put up a show. I mean, I'm a big fan of noir because it lends itself to simplicity. Yeah, you know, for to just have almost a stage with a, a desk and a chair for your detective's office, and you know, a bar and some stools, stools you know, or for that you know hole in the hole in the wall. So. Yeah, you know, I think that some people don't realize it doesn't have to be this elaborate set all the time that you that you, that you, that you may be used to these bigger shows. You know, you know, uh, the bridge doesn't have to lower, uh, you know, over the over the stage to prevent the you know or to present to present below for, in Phantom of the Opera or as somebody mentioned in in a past episode the helicopter at the end of uh, uh, Miss Saigon. You know, it doesn't have to be that all the time. Yeah, I I love that you're making that point. Self, you know, I remember getting friends together and putting a show up, and you really start confronting your own ego. Oh, right? absolutely, one hundred percent. Because you're like, well, of course I have to get a helicopter. So how how do we do this? You know, how of course I have to I have to um, I need all of this. So you're really forced to say, this is, I don't have these resources. And you really get to go back to just a level of simplicity that, you know, self-producing has in, been an incredible experience for me because it actually made me a better writer. Sure. Because you're forced to say, when I have to strip everything away and I can't have that vision in my mind, how do I create rain on stage? How do I do that? Well, your mind, well, of course, water. Nope, there's no water, right? How do I, how do I do, just those simple things. How do I do, how do I do fire on stage, right? And then you're like, oh, wait a second. It forces you to go, well, what are the tools in front of me? Right. Right, how do I use space? How do I use lighting? How do I use sound? And how is, how is that ingrained in my script? in my storytelling, because that's also a part of, of my art form, right? To be instructive in a way where you give people enough room that they can really build and imagine something. Um, 
you know, my dream. And I think, did they do it in London? I, I don't think they did it in, in that way. You know, I'd love to take like Sunset Boulevard. Sure. And like shrink it down to, you know, a, a, a really small theater. And you still have the grandiosity. You still have that in the performance, but then you sort of like pinpoint directly, what is the story about? Who are these people? And what's the relation relationship? Yeah, it's a challenge. And I think meeting that challenge um, as a as as someone who just wanted to get their work out there and um, was a bit bossy, you know, you know, that, that kind of a thing. Um, I was like, I could do this. If you can do this, I could do this. Why can't I do this? So, yeah, I, I love that. But let me fix my... Sure. Oh, you're, you're yeah. You know, it's, it, it's, it, 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 we'll, go, we'll go back to the ego. First of all, I was the same way as like in college. It's like, it's like I, I hate tech. Tech to me was like, this is boring. Can we just oh. wasting my time? And as I started self-producing in, in tech, I always wanted to be coming those moment moments that was it was a this is when everybody's there the whole entire cast mm. crews there and these are the bonding moments while, while while the lights are being focused or something's going on you might find it's boring but guess what this is the time when you can bond with your with, with your your cast your cast member crew it's a good moment to to go over those lines and, and work out those moments make new discoveries and things like that and you know you know as a degree i would i would i was like craft and, and lighting and and this i don't need i'm an actor i don't need this stuff right once i started producing producing it was just like oh my god i wish i would have paid attention yeah the ego got in my way i'm like i don't need this yeah and it's just like i wish i would have paid attention in 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 lighting I know how to program a board so i know how to focus appropriately so i know how to tie a knot or build a flat Mm. Or, remember, or remember even that. just as an actor, like you, you know, you you understand what that light is is how that light is showcasing you in that moment, right? How that light is helping that dramatic moment, that comedic moment, how it's shaping it. You have a relationship. Your performance is in relationship to the audience, the actors around you, the set. The, the lights, the sound, how your voice carries, that level of understanding um, is so powerful. And being able to understand everyone else's tools, right? Being able to understand what, what, what actors love, what, what a lighting designer loves, what, what everybody loves, and being able to say here, you know what? I just gave you, I gave you something that I think is going to be a good experience for you. Um, I absolutely adore that. Oh, tech! Oh my god, I miss it so much. Yeah, I, I love it. The, the yeah, get back into it. I think the other aspect as well as that might help, and I've never really thought about this. In that aspect, is that it helps self-producing. Self-producing actually helps people understand the investment aspect of it. Aspect of it, because yeah. it's, oh, okay. Of your money, did you put forward for, for your own work? And it's like yeah. it's how much money you're, how much money you're everybody else to put up to put up more to produce your work. Right. And I think there's that fear. It's like, well, I might, I, I'm, I'm losing this money. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Hopefully, you're gonna earn it back in tickets, back in ticket sales, and maybe. More. But I also, I also don't think price tag on that experience. You might be out two grand. But you're going to get that two grand back over the next year when you when you decide to print in the following year, right? You know, yeah. You learn from each time. You learn from each time, and I think that's. I love that you brought that up. That's that risk assessment, right? Is something that I I think writers we need to know. Yeah. We need to actually we make it. Now this is a really personal business. Very much so. Yes. This is our work. This represents um, our view of the world. This represents um, our time <laughs> that we put in. Um, it represents our, our ego for some, right? We want to be able to stand in the line of all of these great writers and say, I'm one of them too. 
and we make it so personal and and, and it is and it's, sure. and it's fine um when we give our work to someone and um they're maybe not into it or they say well, there's a vulnerability behind it there's a vulnerability and um it's really important that we have to understand um that every every producer or theater takes a risk. It is a risk. It is a risk. Do it's a risk doing you know maybe uh, you know a revival that people you know maybe the book is completely out of date, right? right? And need you know that could be a risk, right? In terms of how people respond to that, everything's a risk. You need to understand that risk as a as a writer. And I think self-producing again. This is me speaking personally, not on behalf. Of course, of no. This is, I've, I've don't. Yeah. Yeah, but but this necessarily gone gone the gill of my But you understand how those choices are made. You understand. Um, you understand the economics, because you know so many of us write to write. Sure. And we hope that someone has the resources, the 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 wherewithal, the talent to see what we wrote and to bring it to life, right? And someone on the other side is hoping that we give them just enough space to actually do that work and to say, okay, I know you wanted this on that side, but let's try it on that side. You're like, yes, that's so much better. Um, but you know, that's why it's so hard to get things produced because it's risky. And that's why, and I'm gonna say this and people aren't gonna like it, you know, um, there are some individuals who, um, oh, that's popular. I'll do that. You know, I'll, they're, some, that, they're doing that. I'll do that. Yeah. And great. Well, it's, it's a known property. You know, I don't have to put in um, the same amount of work if, as I would, as, if I was doing new work. But then what happens is that writer that has never had a professional production and professional experience they may be denied an opportunity to become a better writer. Well, I think that there's some humility. Uh, we, can just, we can tag this on to self-producing. I think there's some humility too, because I think as, as at least as some writers that I've dealt with, there's an, uh, a level of, of deserving. I deserve, I deserve this. I put on the time I wrote this, I'm deserving to have, you know, have it produced where it's self-produced. And then you, you, Sit back, you watch, you listen to the audience, audience reaction, and you might maybe it's not as good as you thought. You know, um, I just I've I've seen uh, I've seen re I've seen rejection like in in feeds on 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 Facebook and stuff. It's like oh, I got my third rejection letter this week. I, I get I get it. It's it's personal, but yeah. you take a step back and and you know reread your work and maybe. The reason you it's know. you know it's it's you know it's so hard because again i think we we all work in silos right, right? you know i'm 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 creating my work i've spent a lot of time in it i think it's the best damn thing i've ever write i've ever written rather yeah sure and um some of us come from the place of like if you don't get it well you know it's not me could be you who's the right reader and that's a legitimate thing sometimes sometimes it's just the wrong reader um and then you've got theaters who are sort of inundated, right? They're, they're absolutely inundated and they only have so many resources. So then you turn everybody into a data point, right? You turn everybody into a data point because you're just trying to get through, trying to get to the next, trying to get to the next script. Okay, get to the next script. And then as a, as a, as a writer, you're like, oh, you're like, I, oh, you know, that's that return on investment I'm talking about. Right. You know, that return on investment for so many of us is emotional. You know, I've written the best damn thing I've ever done. I want someone to do this. I am so excited. Will someone see what this is? Right. And it takes time. You've got to find the right people. You've got to find people who will be your advocates. So I those rejection letters, and I think it, it's my time as an actor where – I knew I was never going to be good at auditioning. 
you know, that's just not for me. I, I don't think I could handle the emotional toll sure. going to audition after audition after audition. And the actors that are able to do that, those are individuals that a writer should always talk to because like you are the product. You walk into the room. You're here. I am. Don't you love me? Everybody, come on. Everybody loves me. And then all of a sudden they're <laughs> like, and they're like, no, we don't. And the actors that do that really well, they understand like, oh, it's not about me. The people that, the people that will hire me will get me. But sometimes it's not about me. Sometimes I don't fit what they're looking for. And that's a skill as a writer we're not taught to say, I submitted it. Great. It happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. You know? Because that's a hell of a thing to spend your time and you've, you've written this piece and then someone's like, nope. Nope. Nah. <laughs> Not for, you know. You know, it's it's hard. It's hard. Well, I think it's also important to important to in this goes side know what what you're submitting. Mm. Really pay attention to what they're asking you for, because there's plenty of times that I've gotten pieces that don't qualify for what I'm I'm asking. Right. And some writers, I think that well, well, this is this is so good. It doesn't matter if it's not in their guidelines; they're going to take it anyways, or at least they'll read it. And maybe they'll. I, mean, right. I just think it's a way of shooting yourself in the foot. You're wasting somebody's time, especially yeah. for those that actually read the whole entire piece. Yeah, which, yeah. I mean, that's. I mean, that's a whole conversation to begin with. For those festivals, they only read the first or second page, or the first five pages, and then like I'm passing. No, which I think no. Give, 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 you know, give give people time to develop their work. Right. You know. Yeah. yeah. You gotta give people that time. I that you know, but you know we always recommend that people read the submission guidelines. It's really important. Sure. Because sure. also it's your time and your investment. And um again, everything's a risk. And I think we we're still sometimes telling ourselves that narrative of like, you know, I went to fifteen oh one Broadway, I knocked on all the doors. <laughs> And I knocked on this door, and I became a star. Like we still walk, we're still working with that mentality, right? Sure. And we forget that there's another human being on the other side, who is sometimes not the person that makes a decision, right? They're the person that has to collect and get everything ready, and then pass it along. And then they're just here with all of this stuff. And they're like, these twenty scripts don't. They, I. I would love to, but they, you know, I've got to, I've got to put my attention here. Sure. So yeah. it is, it is to your advantage as a writer to, um, and it goes beyond, it actually goes beyond just submitting your work for a specific opportunity. You know, if you're looking at a theater to do your work, is that the theater for your work? It's really, it is, I, I tell writers this all the time. It is your responsibility. You want the Guthrie to do the work? Why? Is it because it's the Guthrie and it, you have your name? You know, that's a prominent theater and, oh, I want that on my resume. Or you love their quality of work. You love what – I always tell a writer, look at their past five seasons. Look at, the, look at what's on the main stage. Look at what's on the second stage. Look at what's in every single house. What are those pieces? Where would your work fit? Where would your work fit? Right. Where would your work fit? Also, what is their aesthetic? Right. What's their view? What's their worldview of what they provide to their audiences? Is 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 that is that the kind of organization that you that will bring your play to life? Or, you know, is submitting like like, like something like the Kentucky Cycle. Do you know what I mean? To to an organization that may not have the resources to do it, you know, is that to your advantage? Right. Do you know what I mean? They're like, yeah. oh, that's a, that's a lot. That's a, okay, great. Or you, you have to do the work. You have to know and and have a, a, an alignment. And, you know, it's the same thing I, I tell writers who are like, you know, I, I want to be produced on Broadway and I'm a New York City kid. Right. I, you know, I grew up native New Yorker, 43 years. That's right. 40, <laughs> going up 44 next month, March. Happy birthday. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Um, you know, this is for me personally, this is my theater world. 
right? And not just Broadway, but off Broadway, off off Broadway. You like whatever that is. You know, I tell people, um, yeah, I want to go to Broadway. Are you ready for Broadway? All right. It's not about the fame. It's not about the glitz. It's not about the glamour. It is the hardest math. It is the highest risk, right? Are you ready for that? Not just your work, but are you ready for everything else that comes along with that? And that's why it is your responsibility as an artist to talk to your peers, talk to the Dramatists Guild, get as much information as possible and make yourself ready for those opportunities that may or may not come your way. Because if you are submitting to a, a festival, read the guidelines. If you want a theater to do your work and you know they believe in the minimalism and you're going, you're like, no, I, this is, is, you know, this is the Ziegfeld Follies here. You're like, oh, there's not an alignment right. there, right? Because now they're going to do your piece and they're going to impose yeah. their 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 view onto your piece. And sometimes that's where the, the conflict uh, in collaboration comes because sure. Sure. You know, we want it here, but is that the theater that should be doing your work? You know? You have to do that work. You've got to build those relationships and you've got to build those relationships with your own self to say, you know what? It's going to, it's going to happen when it happens. And um, it's my responsibility to make sure that whatever I'm submitting is, is the best version of it. And I've read the guidelines. I know what this theater is. I know who this producer is. It's right up their alley. It fits in. Whatever that is, um, I want to be careful with that face, that phrase, because sure. you know sometimes we won't work that work breaks it. boundaries and you know and challenges us, challenges us. form and structure. Um, so finding a theater that wants that, that can, when you're being produced, fully embrace you. You know, what's the guild's view on on submission fees? Or do they have one? Or is that you know, kind of like just do your work and know what you're getting into? We, what's, what's the cost we, we have, um, you know, a number of years ago, we had a um, committee on um, contests and festivals, and we actually produced a, um, best practices for contests and festivals. And the, the, the view on the fee is, you know, we personally never recommend a fee that's too high, right? If there's a if there's a contest or festival that's charging a hundred dollars for you to submit, nine times out of ten they're using it as a fundraising opportunity, mm. right? You're fundraising off of the off of the backs of writers, and again, that's that in recoupment for investment, and that's when a writer gets like enraged, sure, because you're sort of dangling an opportunity, you're charging me, and then. Um, uh, not only am I not getting paid, but, you know, who are you choosing and how are you choosing that? Right. Not, you know, in a perfect world, um, a writer would never have to submit a fee with that, right? And that's the place we would love to go. But we also have to acknowledge, and this is something that we firmly believe, that people need to be paid for that work. So I think it's very much about um, where are those submission fees going? Are they going to pay the readers? You know, are they going to pay the individuals that you will uh, ultimately select? You know, you want to be careful of those opportunities because, again, that's also that's the other part of making a writer um, uh, completely educated about their business is that they will ask those questions. You know, they will ask those questions of, okay, you're asking me to submit $35 where is this money going? So again, it's about poking those holes, looking at our best practices, uh, our guidelines for contests and festivals, and you have to make your own personal choice, right? Every writer has the right to, um, you know, if, if you want to pay that high fee, know what you're getting into. That's your choice. You understand the risk, but at least you've, you've questioned it. Do we want everyone to do that? No. But again, as a writer, the whole point is that we educate you so that you ask the questions 
and that you know how to move forward properly. Um, you know, that's the space that we have to be careful of because we're not a union. Right. You know, that we're not a union. We we can we suggest we 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 build best practices, we educate people. So when we see these things, of course, the thing you want to do is you know send that letter and go, you know, stop doing this. And um, we're not there yet. Hopefully one day we might be, you know, if we can change the, uh, the labor laws so that we can collectively bargain. Sure. Which is something that we're, we're actively um, invested in with other um, organizations that are uh, focused on creative professionals. But, um, you know, those, you have a conversation with, with a writer about submission fees. They'll tell you some stories. Right. Because also, you're one organization charging a fee and you're forgetting that you're one of many organizations that someone is submitting their work to. So me as a writer, in order for me to get my work seen and read, I have to pay this fee multiple times, right? And how much money, again, the return on investment, how much money am I losing? Will I be able to recoup that with a successful production and licensing deal over here. That's great. What what if I'm not? Are we, are we simply funding the theater? That enrages writers. Got it. And I understand, you know, and you know, I'm a co-executive director of an organization, right? I understand um, capacity needs and how how do we do this? And how do we pay for it? Right. You know, but you, you shouldn't do it off of the back of writers. You know, I think there was, there was recently, um, there's a whole conversation, I think online, I forget, forget what it was. And I probably even shouldn't say what it was. So let's, let's not do that. Let's, sure, let's not. Protect ourselves there. But um, I think there was a theater who was, you know, offered a submission opportunity and, you know, there's a fee, but there was no information about um, whether or not writers got paid at the end. So all you see is the fee and, and you see this and then it instantly becomes a conversation that you're using this as a fundraiser. fundraiser. Why would you be fundraising off of the backs of playwrights? That's not right. That, I, you know, that's not, and that's a personal, I'm saying that personally. Sure. As a writer, you know, I'm not saying that in my capacity, uh, you know, as an official representative of the guild. But, you know, writers have it hard enough. And, um, you know, our economic model, it's, a, it's, it's different in film and television, television where yeah. you have, you've taken that time to write that screenplay. And because there is a union that has negotiated on your behalf, there is, um, um, there's a larger payout for you. Right. So if you sell that, if you get picked that. up and you're, or you're working on a show, show. You know, this is the minimum and you're, you're going to, you're going to recoup on your investment really quickly. And then hopefully you'll get another gig and another gig and another gig. And you just keep going for a writer. It's like, all right, you know, do I have to spend, do I have to, you know, spend a thousand dollars for people to read my work? Is that necessarily a fair thing for me? And that's where um, that's where I think conversations like this that you and I are having are really important because I think people forget the experience a writer is having. Right. You know, they again they have made the craziest choice in the world. They have decided <laughs> to write for the theater, and I think it is one of I, I, it is a noble profession. Profession it is. Um, it is a, it's powerful, you know. Uh, I saw Skeleton Crew on uh, this past weekend with my twelve-year-old, and you know when it, theater works, it is one of the most amazing experiences. Same for film and television. When you when it's right, oh, it's an experience that you just want to have over and over again. You want to talk to your friends about it. You want to you want to break it down. And, but for us as, as creatives, um, there's so many different pathways to that level of production, to that production period, 
that sometimes people forget the lonely road of being a writer. And yeah, sorry. I could go on forever. No, that's, that's I, okay. Something like this, where I could go on forever. I got to make sure I'm listening. No, you're good. You mentioned a little bit ago about, about, uh, whether or not, whether or not, whether or not professional production, what, what makes a pr production professional? What makes a production professional? What makes a production professional? Again, how do we define professional, right? Um, because there's different, there's different tiers in theater. I, I think what truly defines a professional production is that there is a theater there's a producer who has financial resources to pay to realize your play or musical on stage, right? They can pay the staff. They, there's a theater, right? You're not being asked to um, invest yourself, right? Because that makes you a producer, which means that you need a different hat on. And there's a lot of experiences that our members have with that. And when you have an experience like that, talk to our business affairs department. So our 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 staff can guide you through that. Um, but to, that's really the definition of a professional. Okay. Right? Right. You're, you're you're working with an entity. You're working, however, that individual or organization that is investing resources in realizing your work, promoting your work, and there. Um, because that's the inherent definition between, and again, a self-production can still be professional. It's just that you're the one doing that work, right. raising those funds, right? Yeah. And, you know, that whole thing. You've probably, probably definitely this in, in the converse, throughout this whole conversation, but I'm going to ask in any ways, in case there's a case there's a we might not have covered, which is, which is playwright join the guild. Say that, any... say that question again. You, you why should why should playwrights join the guild? Well, why should um, any playwright, composer, lyricist, and librettist join the guild? I want to. No, that's great. Great. Yeah, like, no, I, I want to firmly that. acknowledge. I want to leave them out. That, you know, everyone in terms of uh, all of the creative roles and how um, any form of, of of theater is made. You know, there are so many different reasons. There's so many different reasons why people join the guild. People join the guild for um, to have a sense of legitimacy, right? That's that sense of um, I'm joining a professional organization because I am a professional. Therefore, I need to be a part of this. There is um, the sense of community, right? Um, so that you are you can find individuals like you and and have that information exchange and and talk about things and 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 learn and grow there's the moral reason that um you know we didn't make this on our own right we're walking in a profession where professionals have built a role for us sort of people take it for granted and it still happens in a number of places but people take it for granted that um a writer is allowed in rehearsal right. you know that's that's something people had to fight for people had to fight for it there are a number of people who have said yes have said no for that one thing and i'm just choosing one thing just to make it feel effortless right um, so when you choose to be a writer, it's not just about you. You are, this is a profession. We are stepping into the footsteps of every writer. And I say this honestly, every writer, at every level, the writers you know of by name and the writers you don't know. All of those people have made the choice to say, this is what I want to do. Even if I have a second career, even if I have another job, even if I'm, um, you know, a, a mom taking care of my, 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 my family and working with my family, that's my job. Um, so there's so many different reasons. I always tell people, you, you have to find the right reason for yourself. 
you know, I never do a sales pitch for anyone. I never do that because why do you want to join the guild? What are you looking for? What are those particular things that you need as a creative to get to whatever level of understanding and knowledge? Um, I hope everybody joins the guild because, again, it's about professional development. You know, if you're a real estate agent, you're, you know, you're a part of some sort of sort of group that can give you that insider track to give you that information. You're talking to people in your industry. You understand how your industry works. Um, but I, I do hope that everyone joins because um, at the end of the day, how do we change things? How do we make things better if we don't talk to each other? You know? Does anybody ever get denied membership? Um, if they're not a writer, they would get denied membership, okay. you know, um, membership strictly in our, in our bylaws is for, we use that term member for individuals who, um, and everyone that, that submits an application has to prove this for individuals who are playwrights, composers, lyricists, and librettists. Okay. Everyone, when they apply, you've got to, you know, we have a, what, what we call our supporting materials so that you can say, yes, yeah. I am, I've made this choice. Um, you have to back it up. Yeah. yeah. Are there common pitfalls that playwrights that you that they run into with contracts that you that you see? Is that is that something? Being afraid of them is one. Sure. Okay. Being afraid of it, you know. I, I'm not a lawyer. I've looked at a number of contracts where I'm like, what does this mean? Um, sometimes the greatest pitfall is is um, trusting everyone so blindly that you forget at the end of the day we have to make a business arrangement right so sometimes you're working with your friends you're working with people that you trust and then things go in a different direction and that's why it's it's best to you're a professional i don't care if you're if you're performing in the park i don't care if you're in a parking lot i don't care if you're in a community theater or a church or a library you're uh, doing a first class production on broadway you're in a lord theater you're in any of the doesn't make any difference take your work seriously and I, I hear it all the time oh we're friends so we're good mm. you know you don't want to destroy that relationship you want to have you want to have some sort of agreement you want to have something so you understand the nature of your labor and also the nature of theirs, right? You have to. So, you know, being afraid of contracts, sometimes saying yes to things because friends are involved, sometimes, um, and I want to be careful here, so, because uh, you know, I have a tendency to blow things up, so I'm being really, being really nice during this interview. Um, um, but, you know, sometimes saying yes to things with, in, with individuals who have been there um, or show up in certain ways early in the process, mm -hmm. thinking that you have to give up part of your profit in order to, right? But um, you should really, and we have our um, on our website sort of um, considerations for working with directors so that you can sort of really understand those moments when you, when it is appropriate for you to say yes. Right, where they, you see a significant contribution to your work, right? That doesn't happen all the time. Sure. Right. It doesn't. It just doesn't. Um, you know, giving things away without um, fully understanding um, what your role is and what their role is, um, defining defining um, collaborators clearly. Um, there's a there's a lot of people who say, oh, well, I'm going to make them a co-writer because, you know, they gave me some great ideas. Actually, no, this is a, you know, uh, this is a <laughs> expression in a tangible form, right? You have taken those incidental contributions and you've made the choice to actually incorporate them or maybe you haven't, right? But sometimes you don't Sometimes you make those decisions because you actually don't know 
you know, what to say yes and what to say no to. Sure. Right? right. Uh, I think sometimes we lean so heavily on, I like them and I trust them. But, okay. That's great. <laughs> a contract is a contract. It's still business at the end of the day. You know, it could be your mama. Okay. Your mama is your director. You're signing a contract. Sure. Sure. <laughs> at the end of the day, like, that's just the way it is, you know, because that's the real way you develop trust. The real way you develop trust is by acknowledging what you need up front, being honest about it. If things are, if there's conflict, working it out and then figuring out like, okay, I'm giving in here, but I'm not giving in there. How do you develop real collaborative trust without that process? How can a, uh, playwrights avoid being taken advantage of, Jeff. Um, by joining the guild. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> by joining the guild, and I, you know, I want to be careful there because you know everyone has uh, come from different economic backgrounds, and we we do our best to acknowledge that. And um, if someone needs to join the guild and they don't have the resources for it, you know, they can always contact us. So I want to be careful in that, like, oh, I'm promoting the guild because you just want membership dues. You're like, no, that's actually not it. You promote the guild so that people have access to information so they don't get taken advantage of, right? So even if you don't join the guild, the one thing you should do is read our Dramatist Bill of Rights. Just read that. There's a lot of information that we have um, uh, that we don't have a paywall for that you can just take a look at. Understand the nature of copyright. Understand that um, you know your copyright is created the minute you the minute you create something in a tangible form, right? You express it in a tangible form, but it's your, also your responsibility to register that, right? So um, is that the uh, is that the best way that um, Jess? No, say that again. Is that the best way that you suggest to go ahead going ahead and register and registering with the copyright office or? Yeah. Or, so we, or yes. the, one, the one that everybody everybody always says it's just made yourself so it's stamped and just don't open it. No, uh, you know the the thing about copyright is that it, at times you have to protect your copyright, right? If there's ever some sort of lawsuit, or you know, you you want to have complete proof on file with the, the copyright office that this belongs to you, right? So there's the copyright that's created that it automatically, you know, belongs to you, but at some point. When you have to prove that, you want to make it easy for you to prove that. Right. So, you know. So you don't. The guild does not suggest doing the yes doing the mail mail it to yourself. Um. Uh. The guild suggests that you register your copyright. Right. right. Uh, like uh, again, it's like that is the professional way of, of of doing it. It is. There's no beyond fees and you know time, but again, that's taking yourself seriously. You know, that is like, okay, this is my work. I'm going to register this. Great. And again, it's just register. It's registering your copyright because you already have that. Um, but God forbid, you know, someone puts your script online, yeah. you know, and, you know, you want to be able to prove like this is my script. Great. How do I do that? Yeah. Look at my, look at my copyright certificate. Look at that. Um, so even if you don't join the guild, there's a lot of resources that we have on our website that are free but at least take the moment to educate yourself. And, you know, my, my co-executive director, Ralph Savage says this all the time, is that you don't know what you don't know, right? right? And that's a humbling experience, right? Uh, to say that I just don't know, or I don't understand. Right. And so many of us are afraid to say that, but, you know, you have to get to that place of vulnerability where it's okay because sure. i much yeah i much rather you say i don't get it than sign something that you don't understand that maybe no one had an opportunity to advise you on and now you're stuck in a situation that you really regret let's prevent that let's prevent trauma right let's prevent career trauma as much as possible and the best way to do that is to say, I, I understand the basics. I might need help here. And when I need help here, I can go to this people. I can go to the drama skill. I've got my community, but I need to have people who know what is what. 
around me. That is so important. How can people reach you or the guild? Well, uh, like on social medias, or, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, we're on Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook. You know, we have our website. Uh, you know, www.dramadisguild.com. Dramadis with an S. Um, but yeah, people can reach us um, in all forms. Um, it's a little overwhelming sometimes. Just comes up. You guys, what's that? It's a little overwhelming sometimes sure. because it's like, you know, social media has sort of changed the the landscape of of expression. Yeah communication and it's like all right well you know um but the primary way it's just you know you can email us at questions questions at dramaskill.com great officials just do the search and you guys come up we come right. up 102 years old looking really good for our age looking for looking to the next hundred years like acknowledging it. our history and making sure that writers of all different intersectionalities um, realize that at the end of the day, no matter how you, you come to this art form, sooner or later, you're going to have to sign a contract. Have someone behind you just to ask the dumbest question, whatever it is, ask it. Don't be afraid because that makes you more powerful. It makes you more knowledgeable. Knowledge is power. And that's what we're here for. We're here to educate and advocate. Um, so, yes, please come on down. I I think that's a great to, to end this. Okay. Manuel Wilson, thanks for coming on to the Playwright Spotlight. Thanks for tuning into the Playwright Spotlight. I hope the audio issues on my end weren't too distracting and you were able to walk away with some insightful information. If you enjoy this video, be sure to smash that like button, subscribe to the channel, and share this video. If there's a guest or subject matter you'd like covered, be sure to leave a comment down below. If you're listening to us on your favorite podcatcher, be sure to subscribe and leave a five-star review. And in the meantime, and until we see each other again, keep writing.